So good day. This is another topic in the gynecologic module on cervical disease and neoplasia. These are our objectives. Describe the pathogenesis of cervical cancer. We list the risk factors, guidelines for cervical cancer screening, what to do as initial management, and further discuss on cervical cancer and specifically its management. But before that, we always start with anatomy. Where is the cervix? So in this illustration, we see that this is the cervix, okay? So this is the os and uh, it is surrounded by the vaginal fornix, okay? This is the vagina. In this view, we see the ecto cervix, okay, the os, and the endo cervix, okay, and then from there is the uterus, okay. So the cervix is just this very, very, very short portion here, okay. Question. Question, where is the most common site of dysplasia in the cervix? Is it at the squamocolumnar junction or is it at the transformation zone or are those terms the same or are, are those terms just interchangeable? Okay, let's see. This is the squamocolumnar junction. This is where the squamous epithelium meets the columnar epithelium. So it is in that in that arrow there, okay? It's that arrow portion. This is squamocolumnar junction from the name itself. Now, as a woman ages because of exposures with hormones, the original squamocolumnar junction undergoes eversion or ectopy here, ectopy. So the original squamocolumnar junction out, so it goes out to the ectocervix, exposing itself to the high acidity in the vagina. And so from there, it undergoes metaplasia. Metaplasia is one mature epithelium to another mature epithelium. So from there, the transformation zone is created from the original squamocolumnar junction to the new squamocolumnar junction because this is not columnar anymore. From the original columnar, this becomes squamous already because of exposure to the acidic environment in the vagina. And so this is the transformation zone. This is where, this is the boundary bounded by the old or the original and the new squamocolumnar junction there. All right, okay, so here we go. The original, okay, it's, it's hidden and then undergoes eversion, okay, due to influences of the hormones. And the original squamocolumnar junction is here. And because of the acidic vagina, this becomes the new squamocolumnar junction. So from here to here, this is the transformation zone. So to answer where is the most common site of dysplasia in the cervix, the answer is transformation zone. There. What is the etiology or the necessary cause? The necessary cause for cervical dysplasia and malignancy is the human papilloma virus. Depending on the serotype, high risk or low risk, will the disease progress? Since we're talking about dysplasia malignancy, we're talking about high risk type. So HPV is necessary, okay? Persistent infection with high risk types of HPV is necessary, but not sufficient. So the human papilloma virus is a double stranded DSDNA, and it is the most common viral infection of the reproductive tract. HPV 16 and 18 are, be, are known to be responsible for more than 70% of cervical cancer. 
Okay. The peak time for acquiring infection is shortly after becoming sexually active. And so, again, uh, this is a, a sexually transmitted disease. Okay. There, in the box, we read there are many types of HPV and many do not cause problems. HPV infections usually clear up without any intervention within a few months after acquisition and about 90% clear within two years. A small portion of infections with certain types of, of HPV can persist and progress to cervical cancer, which is why in the previous slide, it says persistent HPV infection. It is the necessary cause, but again, it's not sufficient. Why? In the succeeding slides, I'll show you. So just to emphasize that, again, there are several serotypes. And what we are talking about in cervical cancer are the high-risk types, persistent infection with high-risk uh, types of HPV. Okay. How do you get HPV? Regardless, homosexual, heterosexual partners, uh, there is, as long as you are sexually active, you get infected with the HPV. Now, if it's a high-risk type, then cervical cancer or anal vaginal vulvar. We discussed this already in the previous um, topic. Uh, High-risk <clears throat> high HPV strains other than 16 or 18 comprise 30% of the cases of cervical cancer. While low-risk HPV strains, 6 or 11, usually just covers 90% uh, cause of genital warts. So again, just to emphasize, our body is capable of clearing the infection by itself. Okay, usually at 18 to 24 months. So if your immune system is good, then you can... Um, clear the infection faster. Is penetrable sex necessary? No. Again, here are just a review of microbiology. HPV is a sexually transmitted disease, but penetrative sex is not required for transmission. Skin-to-skin -skin genital contact is a well-recognized mode of transmission. So here, how HPV infection leads to cervical cancer. Any microabrasion, it can be because of trauma, multiple sexual partners. Uh, it can be because of the low immune system. It can be of the hormone influenced by uh, OCP use or uh, numerous pregnancies. There becomes a portal. There, we, we create a portal for the HPV to enter. And they really love the cells at the base, at the base. And so the HPV infected basal keratinocytes will be the ones that are affected first and they replicate uh, the viral E6 and E7 uh, paralyzes or uh, deranges the function of the P53 and RB genes which are tumor suppressor genes. And so the cells become immortal. And depending on which level of the thickness of the lining epithelium, the cells become immature, then there goes our classification with the dysplasia or the atypia. So here, normal cervix infected with HPV, because our immune system is very good, the HPV-infected cervix will be able to clear it in 18 to 24 months, approximately. Uh, there will only be mild cytologic abnormalities that regresses or disappears once we are able to clear out the infection. And then it progresses to the precancerous lesion if, again, precancerous lesion, uh, we have CAN1, 2, 3, okay? Again, even if we are in CAN3, 
there is still a chance to regress. However, if it persists, then cancer happens. So this is what I was saying about the layer. If less than one third, then it's CIN1. If more than two thirds, CIN. Uh, if it's two thirds, CIN2. It's more than two thirds, or the whole thickness, it's CIN3 or carcinoma in situ. But if it breaks the basement membrane, it's cancer. Risk factors. What did I say? Uh, HPV is a necessary uh, condition for a patient to uh, progress into cervical cancer, but it's not sufficient, okay? Necessary, but not sufficient because there are other risk factors that predispose us to the progression to cervical cancer. So I keep repeating it. So again, number one, HPV, infection, smoking, OCP use, Immune compromised states, uh, they are coughing, likely they have tuberculosis, which is very common here in the Philippines. Um, sex workers, they have multiple sexual partners, okay? Um, high parity also, okay? Apart from multiple sexual partner, high parity uh, is a risk factor. So primary prevention, how do we prevent? Um, even before the disease has uh, occurred in our body, primary prevention. So there is vaccination. Vaccination is available. We have the bivalent, the quadrivalent, and the nonavalent. Non so from the name itself, two uh, serotypes are covered, the high risk, 16 and 18. Well, in quadrivalent, apart from the 16 and 18, the low risk types, 6 and 11, are included. While in the nonavalent, we add, apart from 16, 18, 6, 11, we add 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. That's nine. According to the CDC, boys and girls between 11 and 12 should receive the vaccine already. So if they receive the vaccine at less than 15 years old, so at 11 and 12 up to 14, they will only get to, they only need two doses to complete the vaccination. So at day zero and between six to 12 months. It can in fact be administered as early as nine years old, as long as it's before sexual debut. However, for those 15, uh, 13 to 26 years old, a catch-up vaccination or above 15, usually it's three doses already. It's zero, one to two months, and last will be the six months after. Uh, unfortunately, for ages 27 to 45, it is a case-to-case -case basis whether or not to give, and it should be in full consent with the patient. Secondary prevention, meaning early detection. Disease is there, uh, but it's in the early stage, so we want to detect it fast so we can be able to treat it. Okay, so cervical cytology testing, or more common, we call it the pap smear or the pap test. We get a sample in the cervix. And number two, we test for the presence of human papillomavirus through, through primary HPV testing. So how do we do pap smear? Insert a speculum in the vagina, visualize the cervix. You get the sample of the endo and the ectocervix, put it in the slide, and look at it under the microscope. And then I will teach you later how to interpret the reading uh, given to us by the pathologist after we submit the slide we sent for pap smear. So this is the change of the protocol from the American Cancer Society. If you see, uh, this was what we follow in our book, okay? The 2012, but there is a recent update American Center Society in the year 2020, instead of starting screening at 21 years old, now we start screening at 25 years old. So this is the main difference. So uh, the goal is to decrease unnecessary tests, but still with early detection. So focusing here, 
HPV test every five years is preferred. However, if HPV test is not available, then acceptable will be pap test every three years. Now, also acceptable is HPV and pap co testing every five years. But again, the preferred is just HPV testing for ages 25 to 29. Now, at 30 to 65, uh, HPV test every five years also preferred. HPV pap uh, co testing every five years acceptable. Pap test every three years also acceptable. So, there you go. Um, this is the difference here, uh, focus here. Uh, apart from the start of 25, uh, the HPV testing is already initiated in the American Cancer Society guideline of 2020. Unlike in 2012, only pap test done every three years. Okay? So again, from in the 2012, from ages 21 to 29, pap smear is done every three years. But for the current 2020 guideline, uh, HPV testing is the preferred uh, diagnostic test uh, for secondary prevention, okay? Starting at age 25 years old. Now, I think it's the same, no? No, no difference. For 65 and above, no screening if a series of prior tests were normal. Why, why start testing at 25? Why start HB testing at 25 years old instead of just the usual pap smear every three years? Number one, the overall burden of cervical cancer is low at uh, 0.8 in ages 20 to 24 years old. Uh, therefore, since it increases 4% at 25, thus testing it beginning this age. There is low cervical cancer death also, 0.5% only for 20 to 24 years old. And then again, it increases to 3% starting 25 years old. Third, the highest incidence and prevalence of infection with high-risk HPV types generally is observed in women aged less than 25 years and decreases with age. And so therefore, uh, the unnecessary uh, detection will be avoided so because it's expected that supposedly we will be able to clear uh, the HPV infections already by this age. And so if we still have it, then it becomes clinically significant. Number four, a significant fraction of treatable lesions are expected to regress, as I was saying, leading to a potentially higher rate of overtreatment and associated harm. See? <clears throat> so this is the, the pap smear result that we expect to see. Okay, we call this the Beth Seda system. We we get the result with comments from the pathologist whether or not the specimen we sent them is satisfactory or not satisfactory. Next, the general categorization: if it's negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy, or if there are epithelial cells abnormalities. Here we'll see that. A typical squamous cells, the L cell, the H cell, or the squamous cell carcinoma. Again, what's the lining epithelium of the cervix? It's ectocervix stratified squamous, endocervix columnar. So <clears throat> if, if this is the squamous component, then this is the glandular or the columnar component. So there are also atypia that you will be able to identify. Atypical glandular cells, adenocarcinoma in situ, endocervical adenocarcinoma, endometrial adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma nonspecific. And also hormonal evaluation will also be there. So what to do? ASCOS or atypical squamous cells with undetermined significance if HPV testing is positive, do colposcopy, okay? If a typical squamous cells cannot exclude each cell, all the more, do colposcopy. If L cell, if HPV testing is negative, then we can repeat 
co-testing after a year. So we can do surveillance. No? We observe for a year and then repeat the test. However, we can go directly to colposcopy for LCL, especially for a positive HPV testing. There. Okay, HCL, 20% will progress to cervical cancer. And so colposcopy is done six months after. Okay, how about with glandular cells? Colposcopy with endocervical sampling is the uh, ideal management. Um, for atypical glandular cells favoring neoplastic, there is a risk for underlying cancer at 3 to 17%. And so... Again, as recommended up here, colposcopy with endocervical sampling. Or, oops, sorry, or endometrial sampling. Okay, so this is how colposcopy is done. This is the colposcope. And then we visualize the cervix. And then if there are really the problems seen, pathology seen, then it is being sampled for biopsy or we treat it right away, of which I will show again later in the succeeding slides. There. Okay. So if an acetic acid is placed in the cervix, then it discolors. Okay. White lesions um, becomes the target of the cryotherapy. We call these as the screen and treat. So we look at the, the cervix, we screen if there are issues, then we treat right away with ablative method, the cryotherapy. We freeze the cervix um, to destroy the precancer lesion discovered during VIA. So again, this is done easy, one step. Visualize with problem, treat right away Okay, with cryotherapy. So speaking of treatment, so what are other treatment options? So cryotherapy is already one of those, the ablative methods here. Ablative methods, uh, criteria. We can only do ablative methods when, number one, colposcopy is satisfactorily done. And number two, the lesion, the mass, and the transformation zone should be entirely visualized on colposcopy. If these criteria are not met, then we forego ablative methods. We have a second option, the excisional methods. Now, these are the indications. If microinvasions are suspected, adenocarcinoma in situ, unsatisfactory colposcopy, there's lack of correlation between cytology uh, and biopsy result. And if we are unable to rule out invasive diseases, or in the cervical canal involvement, or there is recurrence after an ablative procedure, then an excisional method should be done. So the, ad the advantage of the excisional method, the, the cone biopsy, we have a specimen to confirm whether this, the malig it, this is already a malignancy and how about the margin of the specimen? Um, is it clear? So follow up with uh, among patients with cervical dysplasia so the rate of recurrent or persistent disease following excisional or ablative treatment for CIN2 or 3 is 5 to 17% factors associated are very large lesion okay self explanatory and the cervical gland involvement because it's difficult to access and as i said the positive margins so those are factors associated with recurrent or persistent disease. Surveillance following excision of CIN23 with negative margins. Co-testing with cervical cytology. HPV testing at 12 and 24 months. Negative return to routine screening. If any test is abnormal, then do colposcopy with endocervical sampling. If you're your patients fail to do a follow-up and from a high-grade precursor, it now becomes an invasive cancer, then we'll now discuss cervical malignancy. So in the objectives, it did not let us enumerate the histology of cervical malignancy anymore. 
uh, it did not want us to go specific with the staging. And so since management is one of the focus of the objective, we'll have to do a pre-therapy evaluation first. Of course, history and physical examination should be on top of the list. You ask if she had prior history of high-grade precursor lesions, the risk factors, again, there are six. OCP use, smoking, high parity, multiple sexual partner, immune compromised state, and the most important, HPV infection. Now, routine blood studies are also done, IVP or CT, and chest x-ray. Now, it depends on the stage. The stage is very important now. If it's only uh, the cancer cells are only seen under the microscope, then we have it's it it gives us a better prognosis because the procedure to treat will also be simpler. So, however, if we compare it to other stages, as you can see, that's one A one microinvasion, um, still one stage one but the lesion is growing huge. It's still in the cervix. Now in two, it has now spread to the upper one third of the vagina. And here at the parametria already, the 2B. Well, the three has involved other parts, other organs in the pelvis, okay? And so on. So treatment, again, by stage. Stage 1A, the microindication, we can do cone biopsy or the uh, excisional uh, method, the one I mentioned earlier. We can also do simple trachelectomy and simple hysterectomy. However, for grossly um, identified lesion uh, or the 1B, starting on the 1B, radical surgery or radiotherapy. So if we say radical surgery, that's radical hysterectomy. And of course, we remove the pelvic nodes or we dissect pelvic node dissection to check if there is any metastasis to the node because the metastasis of cervical cancer is mainly uh, lymphatics. Now, especially in a growing lesion, concurrent chemoradiation is also being looked at. Now, if we talk about chemotherapeutic drug, if we talk about cervix, it's always cisplatin. So if cervix, cisplatin, chemotherapeutic drug. In cervix, cervical CA is cisplatin. So I think those are the very important details that uh, you should remember in cervical cancer and uh, dysplasia and atypia. Again, very simple. Primary prevention, vaccine secondary prevention is early detection and close follow-up. And of course, if already diagnosed, then we have different treatment modalities. I hope uh, you also are able to look into the Lehman for Lehman's Forum that I shared with you. I was with Dr. Galbo, and it was a very educational hour. Yeah, it was about an hour for us. Um, and most especially, the statistics are of the Philippines. I hope you will take time to watch it. Uh, thank you very much.